Dijkstra here with you on another great math video. Great day to be alive in the math world. So here we are. Today we are creating a frequency table and histogram. So I know a lot of us out there are wondering, well, how do I do all these things? Uh, histogram, frequency table, cumulative frequency tables. So I'm here to go through that with you step by step. Uh, and so to take some notes on this and maybe it'll help uh, guide you through the process. So let's see some steps that basically you want to look at. Number one is order your data set. Okay, put them in smallest to largest numerical order and that will help a lot. Okay, so that's one thing you got to do. Next, find the range of the data. How do we find the range of the data? We take the highest number and we subtract the lowest number. That will give us the range of the data. We divide the range by the number of groups we want. So these are often called classes or it helps determine our class width when we're doing this. Typically, five to six is how many groups we want. We don't want too many uh, because we don't want to spread the, the, the class widths out too wide or make them too narrow. So uh, a, a number that you want to go by is number usually five or six. Then create a class width. So we start with the lowest value. Now, uh, you may watch other people do this, but I always like to include values that uh, on my class width that aren't going to include any of the data pieces itself. And I'll see, oh, you'll show that. I'll show that when I get into the example. Um, so I put a note here. Make the values, make values that cannot include the real value. In other words, if 12 is a value, I don't want to put have 12 as one of my uh, dividers of classes because then I have to always ask, well, does 12 go to this class or does 12 go to that class? So if you make it uh, like a 0.5 or some decimal value, then all the numbers that are inclusive of that half to the next half, then all those can be involved in that one group. Then we create a frequency table. Then we find the frequency for each group and fill in the table. Remember, the number of times a value is represented is the frequency. How many times does 5 appear? How many times does 6 appear, etc.? Okay? Certain scores for tests, a number of people doing something, uh, that's called your frequency. Um, then, based on that, we can create a histogram to represent the data. Now again, unlike a bar graph, a bar graph has different pieces of information. They're usually separated. We've got a bar here and an over space, a bar, a bar, right? There are spaces between the frequency bars. Histograms are all connected. They're all moved together. So that's why it's important to have those values, um, those, those data ranges and your class widths are accurate. Okay. So here we go. Um, let's look at an example. I've got for you here. We have our data. I've already pre-numbered it, so we don't have to take the time to do that. But let's pretend that this data might have been at one time and checked off a tablet or uh, some kind of, maybe someone was using a, a personal device where they were recording data as runners came through and tracked ages, tracked times, tracked something, or whatever, shots on goal for soccer, whatever it might have been, okay? whatever this data may represent. I, I didn't put a story to do it, it's just raw data. Just a bunch of numbers on a whiteboard. All right, so 12 through 65. So I ordered them. And then what we do is step two, again, we, we, we find the range. So the range is the high number minus the low number. And the highest is 65 and the low is 12. So we get a range of 53. We have to decide the number of classes. Now, in this case, I decided to create six classes of information. And so, subsequently, the class width is 53 divided by 6, and that is 8.8. .8. Now, normally with these, when you get a fraction, you want to round up. Even if it's, if it's at 8.2, I would probably round up to 9, because that's the next whole number. It, it keeps you from having some of the end values not be included in a specific class, okay? This way all my values will get included in a class uh, without duplication. All right, so we round up. Um, 
Step four was determine your class width. Uh, because it's 8.8, .8, my class width will be 9. And we will use 0.5 on either side to keep all of the values within the class. All right? And this will make more sense when we look at uh, the data table here. So here I've got a cumulative frequency table. And we have our classes. We have the frequency of those classes. And then we have a cumulative frequency. Now you'll notice that the cumulative frequency is the running total. Cumulative meaning adding it all up, right? Um, when we say that the final at the end of the semester will be cumulative means we're looking at all of the information. So that's what cumulative frequency does, is it adds up all of the information there. So we know that um, we start with 12, but I started mine at 11.5 to include the 12 and stop at 20.5 to include the 20s. Now, had I decided to stop and go from 12 to 20, now the next group might start at 20, but I don't want to start that group at 20 because then I have to ask myself, well, do the 20s go in here or do they go in the next group? Well, I didn't want to do that. So, um, let's move this over a little bit. Right? So, uh, what I did was I created classes where it's 0.5 on either side. 20.5 to 29.5, 29.5 to 38.5. See, there are no 0.5 values, so I'm not worried about any one uh, class holding two or more types of categories. There's no question where, there, where it might go. Uh, and that's important because for some of these exams, you're going to get that data and you're going to have to you know, work on that information. 38.5 to 47.5. Again, I'm just adding 9 to each one. 47.5 to 56.5 and 56.5 to 65.5. And that includes all my data. Right? Everything is included. So the 65 even has a bucket. Had I gone with eight classes, I would have been short when I came over here, and I would not have included the 65 category, and I needed to do that. All right, so now there were eight. If you count them up, the frequency is just how many do you count? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the eight and a, 11 and a half to 20 range. And then there are six, one, two, three, four, five, six, before I get to 29.5. And then there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, before I get to 38.5. 38.5 to 47, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, right, to 42. Then all of a sudden 47.5, well, that's in between here. And now 47.5 to 56, well, that's 1, 2, so we get two of them. And then two more pieces of data there. As we add them up, 8, slide over here because that's the total that we have. 8 plus 6 is 14. 14 plus 6 is 20. 20 plus 6 is 28. 28 plus, uh, 26 plus 2 is 28. And 28 plus 2 is 30. Now when you're done, this value should match your total number of numbers, right? So if I look back at my data set, there's one, two, three, four, five in a, each column, and I have one, two, three, four, five, six columns, right? So I have five, so I have 30 values. So n is 30, and this value is 30. So I'm good. I'm all right, cool. Ready to move on. So that is my cumulative frequency table. Now, let's take a look at the histogram that then represents this information, all right? So in our histogram here, we have all the way up to 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then our same classes. Here's the class width, 11.5 to 20.5, 20.5 to 29.5. See, now there's no question whether my data will fit into this column or this column. All right, so there's one that has eight, and the next three subsequently had six. That matches the table that we built, 47.52, and they're connected just like you would see on a normal um, 
histogram here. So now what I wanted to show you is, so there's your histogram. Looks good. It's all color coded for you. Now what I also want to show you is the cumulative frequency graph. So I'm going to have to scoot us over a minute and not fall. All right. I know that's kind of, I don't have a lot of technology over here, so we're just doing with what we got. All right, so let's see. Here's a cumulative frequency graph. Now, what a cumulative frequency graph does is it charts the cumulative points. And typically, we go in the middle of our classes and find out where those data points sit. And so we can see that as it goes, it's going up, and then it's starting to curve because there are less people near the top here. So we will see it rise sharp, kind of ease off, and then here, and up. Now, what I did was I just took the center of each one and labeled it where the value is because that's kind of the average of the group is there. Now, there's some low and some high. Now, on some cumulative frequency graphs, they get very, very detailed. You might see very, very, very thin lines with each value you could count all the way, and it maps out exactly what your data shows. But this is just in general. What is happening as we accumulate the data? You see we end up here uh, at 30, and so that's where we wanted to end because we know that that's our maximum. Now we could look at certain questions like, you know, how many people are within 30 and 20? And so we could then go here and 30 and count the difference between this value and that value and come down here and try and get some value there. So lots of things we can do with cumulative frequency. We'll get more in detail on that, but um, not very good for a video because it's just not super detailed. Uh, but at least you get the idea, all right? Anyway, that has been another great math time with you. Uh, your host, Dee Dykstra here. Keep it mathy, keep it real, and have a great time with math, all right? Thanks, peace, have a great night. See ya.